It's been a long time coming, but I know my, my change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Friends and colleagues, I give you the fabulous, the talented, the incomparable William T. Young. Oh, isn't it nice when friends talk about you? <laughs> uh, even, it, even if it's not true, uh, <laughs> the things that they say. But uh, thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you for your friendship and as well as Lawrence's. And um, I'm so very honored to be sharing this time with uh, such astute individuals like Chiene, which we have, uh, who, whom we have uh, already heard from, a uh, powerful uh, presentation, and as well as Wes. Uh, I'm so very honored to be sharing this space with them and humbled as well that this gathering, this festival is so very ecumenical. Um, uh, and, uh, but I heard you uh, talk about those two Methodists in that group and uh, I was not one of them. I was the one out, um, but, uh, but very grateful to be with you today. Uh, my, my, my place is to be relief for you in one sense uh, from the last two sessions of heavy thinking and heavy questioning. Um, but in another sense, uh, my place is to get us reflecting, uh, get us started on reflecting on our own time, our own zeitgeist, and how the oppressed of the world in our own day and time are using their place and their space to dismantle the global imperial impulse. Um, I thought I was going to be singing earlier, uh, 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 so I'll do it right now. <clears throat> Pandemic voice. I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long a long time coming, but I know my change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too hard living, and I'm afraid to die, because I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know my, my change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. I go to the movies and then I go downtown. But somebody keep telling me, don't you hang around. It's been a long, such a long time coming, but I know my change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Then I go to my brother. And I say, brother, help me, please. But then my brother keeps on pushing me right back on my knees. Oh, there's been times when I thought I just couldn't last for long. But right now, I think I'm able to carry on. It's been a long time coming, but I know my, my change gonna come. Oh, yes.
blessed will. Revolutionary times have called for a soundtrack, whether one is talking about, whether one is talking about the rise of jazz a century ago or the age of rock and roll just after the Second World War, or the resistance music which emanated from the Black church, the African American church, and became the inspiration, the muse of folk, of R&B, funk, hip hop, and so forth. It's safe to say that if, if uh, the music that you like, it's safe to say, chances are uh, that your, your favorite music was inspired in some way, shape or form by resistance music, even if it's not considered resistance. And it is safe to say that without a cultural soundtrack, a movement cannot be sustained in the soul. Um, as we know, in these last couple of years, uh, 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 this age of fake news and conspiracy theories, we know that not even facts are enough to sustain a revolution. It must be captured in this whole. And the arts serve as a responsibility to take the position in its time of prophets and at least sages, uh, when all around is the consumption and submission to empire. Uh, the arts serve a responsibility to give the lyric that will express the emotions of movement, to give the rhythm of revolution when revolution is called for. So as every BBC documentary seems to begin, I begin by saying, I am on a journey. I am on a journey to find the soundtracks of our current political climate. I'm on a journey to discover where in the year 2021, music is challenging and as well depressing the imperial tendencies alive in the world. Um, I, I watched the film Harriet recent, uh, uh, just last week, you know, the film about, the recent film about Harriet Tubman, the Underground Railroad. And one of the good things about that film is how they make very vivid um, the familiar narrative of how the spirituals were used, uh, uh, that they were used not only to warn people and to get people ready for, for, for moving on, but they were also used to express, to send messages to family back home, to express sorrow about missing family, about to, to tell stories about the master's plans to sell slaves or to kill slaves, those kinds of things. All of those things are incorporated in that wonderful film, Harriet. Uh, um, and so, uh, as we all know, the spirituals, the African-American spirituals are, as Christian culture was initially, a subversive language. Um, and later on, we might want to ask if we have time, because I see already time is pressing on, we might want to ask, where is the church's protest music today? We might want to ask that, and where is it going to come from if it's not there? But first, I wanted to show you um, a video history. Much of this is going to be listening uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, uh, so, so we start now with a short video history uh, of protest music. I figured it's better uh, to hear and see history that, that to hear me stammering and stumbling uh, about uh, about that history. This is from a NBC, a US uh, documentary called Music of the Movement. Mix that Negro with that Creole, make a Texas Bama. <laughs> 
rioting. Everyone's not rioting. There are peaceful people out here protesting, and we just want to be heard. Over the years, musicians protested for fair wages and better working hours, women's right to vote, and an end to war and racism. So the takeaway from that I, I, I wanted us to focus on was the influence of hip hop culture um, as global protest music um, uh, in the same way that spirituals and jazz and blues influence other, other elements of, of global music and especially in uh, the 20th century West. Uh, um, one, uh, the, there's a good case uh, uh, for making uh, uh, that American hip hop uh, has cer certainly lost its edge. It's it's uh, it, uh, for 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 its um, ability to 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 make money, um, but globally, and in the hands of the global oppressed, hip hop is giving power to a generation uh, who are bringing new energy to old movements and uh, as they seek to tell their own story. And one such place that, that this is going on is in Palestine, where in spite of a growing, uh, a growing gap between younger Palestinians and older Palestinians, um, uh, they, seek to tell their own story um, and uh, uh, as, as their lot in life seems to be to continue an ongoing battle, uh, either continue the ongoing battle in their homeland or become part of the growing uh, Palestinian diaspora. Um, now last year, last summer, um, uh, an interesting event happened that popped uh, that uh, that uh, was swept under the rug somewhat. Um, amidst the COVID pandemic, the Israeli government began moving forward with plans. So, some of you will, will remember that, uh, moving forward with plans to absorb more parts of the West Bank, which had approval by the former US presidential administration and in violation of international law. And in response to this, a Palestinian radio station called Radio Al Hara, uh, Radio Al Hara, um, uh, which is a Palestinian station based in Bethlehem and Ramallah, but heard throughout the Middle East, um, they organized a three day global protest featuring uh, resistance music from throughout the Arab world. And this was held in July, uh, between the 8th and the 10th of July. And they called this uh, online uh, pandemic protest, uh, Phil Mishmish, which is an Arabic term meaning in the time of the apricots or when apricots bloom. Um, that's taken uh, basically by meaning to mean the equivalent of, of what we say here in the West, wishful thinking, or it'll happen when pigs fly, that kind of stuff. Uh, so Phil Mishmish. Um, but this event, uh, this protest is notable in many ways. Uh, uh, for one, it speaks to a young diasporic audience. Um, for a second, it uses di digital media to sustain a global diasporic movement and to show solidarity in the shared experience throughout uh, the Middle East of racism and religious discrimination. And then thirdly, uh, it's notable because it makes a statement in a time when the priority uh, was the pandemic, but as we know now, uh, not even the pandemic can can silence uh, young people who are being uh, who, who who feel it is their role, it is their lot to speak out against the oppression uh, that they are facing. 
So the first uh, piece of music I want to wanted you to listen to uh, is a, it's called Torah Baye, Torah Baye, um, uh, and uh, this uh, song you'll hear the hip hop, the obvious hip hop influence, but. Um, this song expresses the realities that cause so many young people to make the decision to leave Palestine. Um, and it speaks to the to many of the issues that we heard about uh, Kevin and Lawrence and, and Rachel and others who might be in those of us who visited Palestine in 2019. Um, it, it's, this song speaks to many of those issues, the restriction of land and as well burial rights for Palestinians, speaks up to being, uh, to, to, to growing up Palestinian, wanting to be a soldier, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the uh, PLA, but realizing as you get older how pointless um, that whole militarism is. And so it, spe it speaks to issues like these and many more. And don't worry, um, there will be English subtitles here. <laughs> This is youth music, and so uh, uh, there will be some vulgarity uh, 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 in some of this, but I th hope that you will agree that there is especially in revolutionary times, there is a grace in using vulgarity. Um, uh, when, when, when you have been oppressed as deeply as say Palestinians or people of color have been, uh, um, there's a grace certainly in vulgarity. Another Palestinian hip hop artist that uh, wanted us to listen to was, uh, uh, he, he, he's considered to be the father of um, of Palestinian hip hop, and his name is Dom D A M, um, and I'm not sure yet whether D A M Dom is a sort of a reference to uh, to such vulgarity, um, uh, and and the the hate and anger that wells up inside one. Uh, but uh, he's considered to be, he's been out for a while. And so he's considered to be one of the founding fathers of the hip hop movement in, in Palestine. And he wrote a, and he produced a song called, uh, um, uh, it's called Mama, I Fell in Love with a Jew. That's what I want you to listen to, to. So much of his music is very apropos to listen to, but I wanted to listen to this one. It has a sort of R&B ballad, hip hop ballad style to it, but it talks about the concept of intercultural marriage, interreligious marriage, interracial marriage, if you will, and all of the challenges that one uh, uh, faces with that. How, how, how do you uh, control love? How do you control love in the face of political uh, in, injustice? Mama, I, I fell in love with a Jew. Her skin is white and my skin is brown. She was going up, up, I was going down. So there is a bit of humor in there, um, but uh, obviously it speaks to a very real reality 
uh, uh, for, for young people uh, in the IOPT. Well, I want to move on. Uh, we've got about 18 minutes left. Uh, I want to talk about Brazil, which is another nation where a new generation is dealing with uh, old problems, namely far right populism and uh, racism. Um, you, many of us will know a, a, a bit of the history of Brazil and uh, its history with music. We'll know a bossa nova, you know, a girl from Ipanema. Um, and that whole uh, movement, bossa nova, sort of represented the co optation of uh, uh, this music uh, for, that came from Brazil's African communities um, and was sort of appropriated in the 50s and 60s in order to sell Brazil to the world. Um, so, so Bossa Nova songs like Ipanema talks about sun and fun and palm trees and beautiful women with curv cur curvaceous features and all these things. That's what Girl from Ipanema is about, or a masquinada. Um, but Bossa Nova only actually only lasted a couple of years um, as a musical movement before the military dictatorship took over. And in 1973, I wanted to, to, to share this particular song with you. Uh, it's an example of some of the protest music which was happening during the military dictatorship, um, like that of uh, music of uh, Gilberto Gil, um, one of the one of the great uh, composers of uh, Brazilian music, and uh, Chico Buarque. Um, they, they came together and wrote a song in 1973 called Calice. Um, Gil wanted to, Gilberto Gil wanted to write a song to protest the censorship against freedom of speech um, the, that had begun to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, um, symbolize the dictatorship. And they use the words of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane to express the sense of betray the sense of betrayal by the powers that be and the need for new life in the face of death. Let's pass away from me this chalice, Father, pass away from me this chalice of wine tinted with blood. And so this is Chico Bordarque singing. Calife. Centro da cidade, afasta de mim esse cálice, afasta de mim esse cálice, afasta de mim esse cálice, de vinho tinto de sangue. Talvez o mundo não seja pequeno, nem seja vivo, fato consumado. Well, what's been part of uh, musical culture in Brazil uh, from, from, uh, uh, from slave songs and, and, and slave rituals that the elites in Brazil for years, uh, you know, wanted to dismiss um, to, uh, at first they dismiss it and then, and then after a while uh, they see the profitability of it. And uh, they realize that it's good to uh, it's good to get on board to that bandwagon. That's how people like Carmen Miranda in the 1950s. Um, she was very popular in her day um, in, in Hollywood movies, and she sort of represented what Brazil, uh, what they wanted, what the elites wanted to uh, uh, present to the world of what Brazil was. But of course, these days, she's not as She's not as honored in that country because of that. But lastly, and very briefly, I wanted to go to my new home, uh, um, uh, Washington, DC, and to talk about a musical culture there uh, in the form of go-go music. No, we're not talking about the go-go clubs of the 60s and stuff, girls in the, in the, in the uh, 
uh, in the uh, cages and all that kind of thing. No, uh, this this is a, a, a very different kind of go-go music. It's a great example to me of a local musical tradition, especially in America, um, that is not been popularized and it's not been appropriated and yet it's reaching out to young people and uh, providing an impetus to uh, the social movements that have gone on in the last several years uh, like uh, Black Lives Matter notably and, and other issues. Um, it is actually a 40 year old musical uh, tradition native only to the DC area, what we call the DMV, Maryland, Virginia, uh, and the District of Columbia. Uh, and it's a fusion music. It's a fusion of jazz, of funk, of rap, African rhythms, you'll hear drums, uh, the clanging of drums, and as well, everything, uh, including the kitchen sink, it seems. Um, People call it party music, but, but they also call it church music because many, they, many in DC say it emanated not just from the streets, but it also emanated from the church. It began in the church. And so you have a mixture of things that's an experience. It, 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 as all protest music is, it's an experience. Uh, and it utilizes, uh, you know, the sort of call and response tradition, um, audience interaction, it's all important. Um, but it also tells a message about being young, black, uh, in the capital of the wealthiest nation on earth. Uh, uh, for many years, uh, up until last decade or two, uh, Washington, D.C. was noted for being Chocolate City um, because uh, for, for mo most of Washington DC's history, it has all uh, been majority African-Americans uh, who have lived there uh, uh, in the last um, couple of decades because of gentrification for one, the high rate of, of, of rent and, and, uh, and the lack of a chance to own a home, all of these issues, even though they've always had black people as mayors, um, uh, that political, that political, uh, that political uh, uh, um, advantage uh, has not reached the poorest uh, in DC, and even as, uh, uh, the, the movement for another issue is uh, in DC is the movement to make uh, Washington DC the 51st state in the country. Uh, I, I don't uh, know, uh, and, and um, go go music, uh, the lyrics it expresses, uh, have long been a part of that movement. Um, Go-Go music has had its own history like Brazil of being ostracized by the elites in the 1980s during the heroin and gang crises. Uh, uh, the District of Columbia imposed curfews on people who would go to Go-Go concerts and Go-Go clubs. And the music itself served as a kind of scapegoat for the city's social problems in the in the 80s. Uh, uh, but, but last year, uh, Muriel Bowser, the current mayor of DC, made go-go music the official music for the city of Washington. <laughs> By the way, they are they are lighting up sage. That's sage, not cannabis. Uh, that's all, all I will say now. Is, is there anyone who would like to reflect on uh, uh, anything that you've heard or seen in the last hour?